to our DC Parent Voice and Choice Week. Uh, you have actually met with us all five years um, that we've been meeting. So we just wanna say thank you for always taking the time to hear from parent leaders from your ward um, and really to center yourself in their voices and their concerns. And so we really appreciate all the time that you take um, for them and for their voices and for equity in our city. And so I'm just so excited to get us started this morning and to honestly turn over the show to one of our amazing parent leaders, um, one of our great dads, Ray Douglas. Um, so I'm excited that we have two awesome black men on the call today leading the charge, both you, Councilmember McDovey, awesome black dads, um, and uh, Ray. And so Ray, I am gonna turn it over to you to go ahead and get us started. Where is, is Ray? Can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. We just got knocked off. The challenges of the internet during COVID. <laughs> we, we all understand. All, every single one of us. So I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Maya. Uh, welcome to Parent Voice and Choice Week, everyone. Parents and policymakers. My name is Ray Douglas, and I am a resident of Ward 5. Um, I have... I'm a proud parent of four children. Uh, I have a seven-year-old named Rhea, who's a second grader at I Dream Public Charter School. I have a, a first, grade, first grader who is six, Reagan, who is at I Dream as well. Uh, I have an 18-year-old freshman at Clinton College in Rock Hill, South Carolina, by way of our living room and her bedroom due to COVID. And also um, our son, a 20-year-old, uh, Jaquay, who is a student at UDC and is in the workforce as well. Um, I'm so happy that, uh, and feel privileged to be the meeting chair today. I will be facilitating today's uh, conversation to make sure uh, that our parents' questions are all um, answered and being able to ask and have their voices heard and monitor the time as well. Um, I'm thrilled to be back uh, in the decision-making process uh, with my, these, my parents, my fellow parent family, and Councilman McDuffie. Um, first of all, I want to ask all of our Pay family, if you will, in the um, chat, post your name, um, your ward, your children, and your school, and their schools. And if you'll do that as well, as soon as you can, that way um, Councilman McDuffie will know who all is here today. Councilmember Council Member McDuffie is very excited to meet with us today during DC Parent Voice and Choice Week and to hear from all PAVE parent leaders. As parents and guardians of our, our city's children, you are a critical voice in education policy. And I'm so excited to be here with you during this time. At this time, we're gonna open up for remarks. If you have any Councilmember McDuffie at this time, I, um, I've, I've got some that are prepared, but, but honestly, I, I love spending more of the time uh, when we have these types of conversations with answering your questions. I think, you know, given how critical um, uh, the pandemic has impacted uh, individuals, families, health-wise, economically, um, the collateral consequences obviously have been uh, severe as well, including uh, our education. I think, you know, there was a very important hearing last week, uh, and I know there are a number of questions probably related to that. Um, more importantly, just the disparities that I think continue to exist across our schools, uh, which I think have been exacerbated as a result of the pandemic, uh, and the inability of, of some students to, to simply have the resources that others have. And so I think uh, there's a lot of work uh, left to do. I think the vaccination process, the rollout has been uh, a, a really challenging one for the District of Columbia for a host of reasons. Uh, I'm not prepared to get into all of them today, but you probably follow uh, some of the things that I've said publicly about the rollout and, and the fact that the folks who've been uh, most impacted negatively by the pandemic uh, were initially not the ones who were able to get the appointments to get the vaccines. And so, um, 
Uh, the city is 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 limited by uh, the number of vaccine it's receiving for the federal government, uh, but I just hope that we can do a better job of giving it to those individuals who are in the communities that have been hardest hit. I know we need to get them obviously to uh, our teachers uh, who would like to take the vaccine and we need to get uh, uh, a level of confidence uh, in our parents, teachers, and everybody else in our school community so that we can get these schools open and get uh, people back inside the buildings safely in a way that there's some level of agreement. So um, I, I really like to spend the time as we had before uh, where you all are asking specific questions that, that impact you and the folks in your parent communities. And so I'm gonna stop my remarks right there and, and, uh, and just turn it back over to you, Ray. Okay, thank you so much, Member, Council Member McDuffie. We sure appreciate your, your thoughts and your remarks with us. And we look forward to a healthy discussion today. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our first parent question asker, um, Miriam, who is a, a Ward 5 PLE board member, Langley elementary parent, who is going to be asking about mental health supports. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Council Member McDuffie. Good afternoon. Uh, have a chance to talk with you, familiar working with you uh, under the leadership of Christina Robbins last year, you helped Langley a lot with a lot of our um, structural infrastructure issues. So I wanna say thank you for that. So a lot of work to be done, but thank you. So my question is, I am a Ward 5 resident and the mother of a fifth grader. The relative isolation brought on by the virtual posture that we have been in since March, 2020 has taken quite the toll on everyone and put enormous strain on our interpersonal relationships. One thing in particular that is quite tasking is having to be intentional about protecting my son's mental well being. Prior to the stay at home order, my husband and I had the luxury of keeping our adult problems and concerns out of our child's space. Now we do not. Living in close quarters means he has front row seat to all of the emotions and all of the feelings that this past year has wrung out of us. He sees our fights when tensions are high, our tears as we have mourned loved ones lost, our anxiety over dwindling resources, our fears over health concerns, and our outrage at whatever foolishness the world has on offer any given day. As much as we have tried to keep things as normal as possible, there have been moments when the intensity of these emotions engulf everyone in the household. And I know we are not the only ones. Regardless of socioeconomic status, race, background, all of us have been pushed into a hyper emotional state, the manifestation of which is severely impacting not just the mental health of our kids, but in some cases, their very safety. Teachers and other community professionals report more than two thirds of child abuse cases. However, many centers reported drastic drops in the number of reports when schools closed in March last year. Nationwide, there were nearly 40,000 fewer cases, which was about a 21% uh, drop when compared to the number of cases reported in 2019. Child abuse did not decrease. Educators just can't catch things easily during distance learning. We've also seen a re reduction in domestic violence reports. Again, domestic violence did not disappear. In fact, women, particularly women of color, lower income, undocumented immigrant women, native women, and LGBTQ people are experiencing higher rates of domestic violence. And once again, there is a spillover effect on any kids in those homes. So here's my question after saying all of that. How can we work together to improve the referral and support systems to ensure that our students and their families have access to appropriate social, emotional, and mental health support while in this current virtual posture? How do we better equip our teachers and other staff engaged in distance learning with the skills and tools needed to identify potential abuse cases in a way that prioritizes the safety of the potential victims? Thank you very much for spending the time to listen to my question, over. Actually, I think I just muted. Uh, I appreciate your question and, and, and sharing that personal uh, anecdote. 
Uh, look, I, I know it's been a challenging for everybody. I know what's happened inside my, my home and I, I'm sure a lot of folks are experiencing the same thing. The levels of anxiety are higher. Uh, the things that people uh, normally don't see when they're working inside of their office buildings, families are sharing small spaces and the resources within these homes just simply aren't the same. Uh, and, and it's resulted in uh, some of the challenges that students have had with learning, but also some of the stress levels and the collateral issues associated with uh, the health uh, of the pandemic and how it's impacting people throughout the District of Columbia generally, but I think more so in communities of color where the resources aren't the same. Uh, in terms of the referrals, uh, I think we really are dependent on uh, the people who are interacting with these folks the most. Uh, we want parents to the extent they can uh, to ask for help. Uh, and to make sure that they uh, are reaching out to the appropriate folks to receive any sorts of help that they might be able to receive under their own insurance. Uh, and obviously, if there are criminal matters involved, then we want people to call the police. Uh, but we want our teachers as well, who are uh, administering these classrooms through our virtual learning to, to really be involved and to be mindful of what's happening uh, to these students. I've, I've heard some stories, I've seen some of this stuff online and social media that some of these teachers are seeing, unfortunately. Uh, that are transpiring inside of the homes uh, during classroom because students are uh, have no choice but to have uh, the, the, the virtual learning environment right now. And so I think that's why it is so important that we can safely get kids uh, to school in person. It is important that we get the vaccines distributed to the uh, teachers uh, who would like to take the vaccines, who would like to work, you know, which is why it is so important that the kids that are at highest risk uh, in these communities are able to uh, get the resources that they need and that we're looking at these schools based on uh, you know, the levels of school the student populations that are at risk and how we're prioritizing who gets the resources in terms of vaccine and other things to get their classrooms open first. Uh, and so you know, I don't have all the answers about how you address domestic violence and the other uh, consequences that have resulted from this uh, pandemic. Uh, but to the extent that you all can share with us things that we should be doing more of, to the extent you all can, like you have in the past, share with us priorities around increasing uh, the funding for uh, mental health services like we did uh, last year for the fiscal year 2021 budget, uh, then obviously I'm, I'm willing to continue partnering with you all to do so. Uh, uh, to the extent I can squeeze any additional funding out of my Committee on Business and Economic Development, which I have uh, done in the past when you all have laid out your priorities, I am obviously willing to continue to work with PAVE uh, to, to address these priorities that you all have laid out. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman McDuffie. Um, is there a way that you could uh, provide um, some of the tangible uh, items that we can do together? Yeah, you mean as a follow-up, right? Yes, uh-huh. Sure, absolutely. And, and look, I, look, I'll tell you this. You all probably have more people on this call who are experts in this field. So, so I, I don't want you all to simply rely on, on, on my office. Uh, I, what I do appreciate is that there's been a collaboration with PAVE over the years. And so, uh, yeah, but we're, we're happy to follow up with you all with some specifics and, and to the extent you all have uh, specific items that you all have laid out uh, in terms of recommendations, uh, then, then we're happy to work with you on that. Thank you so much. And um, at this time, I'm also, uh, thank you, Miriam. And at this time, I'm also going to hand it over to our next parent leader, Ana Rodriguez, uh, who is on the citywide board and our Ward 5 PLE board member. Um, she's a Duke Ellington High School and Langley Elementary parent member. Good morning. I'm at work currently. I work at a grocery store. Had to uh, literally leave from working home because of you know COVID. Due to COVID, I needed to make more money, so I'm working two jobs. Um, I don't know if you remember about. I think it was about three years ago at Inspired Teaching School. Our school was um, at the time my daughter was going there. And this is when I first seen you in action. Um, the school was um, trying to get the back of the building. And they, I remember you, you came and your aunt had, uh, was in the neighborhood and she was complaining that she felt like the school was taking over the community. 
And it was, you remember you speaking about how you grew up and it was a field house and how the importance of the community in the field house. Now there's a DPR community center back there. But I remember the importance in you and how you, you know, you came out, you weren't scheduled and you showed up and you spoke in front of everybody because of the change that was coming in the neighborhood. I'm a Ward 5 resident. I live in the Bloomingdale area and that neighborhood has changed dr drastically. Um, my daughter's a fifth grader at Langley and I'm gonna read you my question. And then um, I'm not a person that reads questions but you gotta write things in order. So my question is many kids and families are suffering right now without access to strong educational options during the pandemic. The results of COVID-19 and the sudden shift to virtual learning are still yet to be fully understood, particularly the impact of these changes on children's mental health. Not every household is equipped to deal with this, and we can see inequality on how certain families have been able to manage virtual learning. As a parent, I have an older child who can support my younger child, so I'm able to go into work, but not if every family has that option. We know that not all families need support and that we need representation at the decision-making table. PAVE has put together a comprehensive plan for what parents want to see about school reopening, inclu including cross-sector coordination to ensure that families will, children in multiple schools or networks are able to have their needs met. What's your plan for ensuring that parent voices are heard in the school's reopening process? And I, I so, love the, oh, uh, go ahead. So I, I was, I'm sorry, I had to get out the screen. So my, my thing is, is that with my daughter being home, like there's a need for school to be open. That's where I'm at now. At first I wasn't a parent that was like really for the school to open, but as my daughter is, education is dwindling down and she's not really grasping and she's really behind my fifth grader. I just want to make sure that when this school opens, that are you going to or is, is are y'all going to ensure that the equality of every school is going to be treated the same, and that they're going to open safely? Well, I think the not I think I know that the safety uh, of the students and the teachers uh, who are reentering and and the, uh, every person uh, in the school community that works inside these buildings, their safety is my top priority. Uh, the the concern that I have is that. Uh, right now, the way things are happening is not equitable. Um, all the school facilities are, are not, uh, uh, they're, they're scheduled to receive the same types of renovations in terms of filter systems and things like that. Um, but, but, but when I reach out, uh, as I have been throughout the pandemic, my team and I trying to solicit feedback uh, from individuals and teachers and principals, uh, we're getting mixed results. Uh, I know that the DCPS has spent a, a, a significant amount of money to, to, to retrofit uh, in many areas to make sure that safety uh, uh, checklists have been addressed. And I know charter schools have been doing it as well. I will tell you, uh, and I do remember uh, the, the, the time that I was at Inspire that you described, uh, because my aunt was there and, and my aunt is fairly remarkable. Uh, and and uh, I do remember sharing a story of, of attending Shade Elementary School, which is now inspired and, and put in the $20 million in the budget for that, that recreation center, because I know how important it is for, for students and families to have uh, top quality schools, but also other amenities that support the quality of life of communities. And when it comes to the schools and reopening and ensuring that that, that parents have confidence to send their kids back to these buildings and that they'll be safe when they do so. Um, obviously we can't promise anything because um, uh, I've experienced personally the impacts of COVID-19 uh, uh, on, on people who are, are, are close to me. Uh, and so even when people are taking the utmost precautions, uh, things still happen during this pandemic tragically. Uh, and I say all that to say that yeah, what concerns me is is what you just described. You've got two kids, and it sounds like you know one of your your, your students is 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 learning uh, better in this stay at home virtual learning environment. And I think it speaks to the disparities that are existing with uh, people in their households. Uh, both kids, again, from well-resourced uh, families and others who are not. But even when you have 
kids in the same household, it doesn't mean you get the same results. How do we measure that to ensure that when they go back into these school buildings, the kids get what they need? That is my biggest challenge, and I think that is our biggest challenge, uh, measuring the, the effectiveness of the virtual learning that is taking place right now, because we know uh, what some of the early data say about who's falling behind. And it is primarily the kids of color, right? So what does that mean? And how do we make up for that? Uh, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, any, in all solutions that address uh, uh, some of the declines that, that families are experiencing with their kids uh, during this pandemic. Uh, you know, what that looks like, whether it is you know, some of the things that people were talking about over the summer or other resources to gauge, identify, and provide the necessary supports so that we can uh, get these kids back on level uh, is gonna be, I think, one of the most important things that we can do. Getting them in the school building safely is paramount, but really gauging where each individual student is and getting them the supports that they need uh, to the extent there's been some declines over the pandemic. Uh, and in some instances, like we've seen, uh, the, 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 it's not just been simply kids who've seen declines, some of the students have gotten better. Uh, unfortunately, that's not typically the case with the kids of color that we, we, some of the early reports are coming back to us. So um, your safety, your student safety uh, is paramount, uh, but ensuring that the resources exist to these principals, that they have everything they need to feel confident, that these teachers have everything they need to be confident to go back. Because otherwise, I don't know many parents who are gonna wanna send their kids back to school if they don't have the safe learning environment with the teachers who uh, they know or uh, care deeply about their kids. And I've been to Langley, by the way. I know the first two parents. I, I actually visited Langley last year and did the tour with Principal Kellogg and the other staff who provided it. And I appreciated all the things that they were doing to create that safe environment uh, for your students once and finally when they do return um, in person. Is there a way, um, Councilman McDuffie, to um, possibly have like maybe listening labs for parents so they can get uh, for better ways to get like parents engagement? I am open to that, uh, Ray, in, in making that sort of recommendation. When you say listening labs for parents, uh, I do get concerned about you know the, some of the parents who might not be able to avail themselves of a listening lab and, and ensuring that. Uh, whatever resources are provided in a listening lab, reach the parents uh, uh, and all the schools who need to benefit from the information. And so I'm, I'm open to that. Do you know, are you all aware of, of, of any of the schools that have already done that and whether that is, is proven to be successful in your estimation? Not off the top of my head right now, um, but I do believe that um, Deputy Mayor, um, Kind had mentioned about the possibility of doing that um, as well. Did he, uh, I'm, I'm open to that. I mean, it, the short answer is yes. Um, just sort of what that looks like, how it gets rolled out, and, and how do we make sure that uh, it has uh, it's accessible uh, to to all the parents who would like to, to to be a part of that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Councilmember McDuffie, and. Um, our next parent leader is Yvette Shelby, who's a citywide um, board member and a Ward 5 PLE board member as well, and a parent of McKinley Tech and Capital City High School uh, students. Good afternoon. Um, so I am a proud um, Ward 5 resident and parent of 10th grade twins. And um, I'm very fortunate that both of my children have received um, technology and both are doing quite well in their studies. However, I know that, and as we've mentioned previously, that is not the case for all DC students. And this further exasperates the inequities within our system. I also know that you're faced with having to make hard decisions and budget trade-offs 
during this time. Every student in DC deserves to attend an adequately funded public school. Yet the uniform per student funding formula is failing to keep up with the rising costs of education and in particular, literally underserving students who are identified as at risk. In order to serve students and families equitably in this unprecedented time of crisis and need, DC needs to fully fund the at-risk weight in the UPSF code in the recommended adequacy level in order to meet the needs of at-risk students. How can we work together to ensure resources that promote and ensure equity in our schools so that we give students, educators, and families what they need to help our students become successful? One of the things that I'm, I'm happy to report, I don't know if you all followed it, but uh, uh, I, over the last few years, have been working on a measure that uh, we call the Racial Equity Achieved Results Act. Uh, it's the REACH Act for short. Uh, and uh, as recently as last week, the uh, council wrote out our uh, council office on racial equity. And uh, we're gonna be utilizing the resources of that office uh, which has uh, four FTEs right now to support some of our efforts. We obviously, the council budget office has been uh, really helpful uh, for members when they have budgets where we're trying to identify extra resources uh, over and above what the mayor presents in her budget. So to the extent uh, uh, we can work to see what the mayor has done uh, in terms of her per, per pupil formula, uh, which is what the council has done over the last couple of years is, is add uh, to what the mayor has submitted in her budget uh, to try to make sure that we are providing the most equitable uh, funding uh, as possible. And so I have no doubt that we'll do that uh, again. I can't speak for my colleagues. I'll speak for myself and as chair of one of the committees uh, to continue to try to support uh, doing that. Uh, but I think what, what the reason I mentioned the core office because uh, everything that we do with terms of budgets and other things, just like they have a fiscal impact statement that's going to come along with the budget when we pass it, um, we're going to be looking at the, the Council Office on Racial Equity uh, to, to give us a, a racial equity impact assessment as well. And so I think this would be one of the areas where we could be looking uh, to partner together to make sure that uh, we get specifics around per pupil funding uh, on the education areas of the budget. Uh, when we go to pass it. Thank you so much, Yvette and Council Member McDuffie. Um, our next parent leader um, is, is Zuma Sumbarera. Hey, can, I, can I say something really quick? Oh, right? I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I know that you all always been, I mean, you all have been really strong and, and, and really well organized with when we have these types of conversations. And I know that you all have a document that that my office and I have um, that you've submitted and we'll, we'll go over it and we'll try to, you know, we'll obviously work with you all on those things. I'm curious as to, as to whether when, when we talk about per people funding and things like that, you all are similarly meeting with the executive. Do you all meet with the executive as well? In addition to council members in this sort of format? You do okay. All right, great. Okay, I was curious. I hadn't asked you that before, and I was wanted to make sure. So, because I think that making yeah, sure I think Councilmember McTuffie, when you say executive, our parents and all know what that means because that's the mayor. insider oh. baseball a little <laughs> the bit. Mayor. Um, the mayor. Right. The mayor. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The mayor's office. They know what that means. So yes, they okay. had a meeting with DME Kine earlier this morning, actually. Because mm -hmm. I, I mean, they they the the Reach Act requires the the mayor's office, the executive under the city administrator, to similarly have establish an office of racial equity. And I'm not sure that, that they've stood that up yet, but I think um, one of the things that you all should be considering is, is, is how important I think that office will be to the work that comes from the mayor's side, just as the council office on racial equity, I think, and I hope uh, it's gonna have a significant role on the budget that we pass uh, in determining whether funding is equitable in certain areas. So I just wanted to offer that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again, Councilmember McDuffie and Yvette. 
Up next, we have our fourth parent question asker, uh, Zoma Barrera. She's a Ward 5 PLE board member, uh, Bria DC Prep, and Paul P uh, Public Charter School parent, who is going to be asking about school-based mental health supports. Hi, thank you, um, Council Mark, 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 Mark Duffy for to be here with us. Uh, my name is Zulma Barrera, and I feel very fortunate to be able to, to be here. Um, we have been advocate for educate in Washington DC for a few years, especially in the area of mental health. Right now, we are need more than ever those services for our child. Uh, a bite of my story is that I have a daughter that have a 16 years old, and she just came uh, to this country a year a year ago, and the transition plus the pandemic and the situation affect her a lot in in the education system. My second daughter, uh, she have 10 years. And she has a IEP um, in the virtual years. It's very frustrating for her. So I believe that today, more than ever, the children require mental health support and service. Once our, our purpose uh, solution is to create a uh, like a pipeline of mental health professionals, special, especially professionals. Uh, that people are in charge in DC for our kids. So DC could do this by making a partnership with the local universities and help uh, our neighborhood put it this like juridization in, in, in our warm to encourage those mental health professionals to work at a school in DC. My question is, how can you ensure that or children can receive help from mental health professionals and fully found that expansion to put more children in the school. I think this is more serious issue than we think and we need professional people to help family from uh, with, within this school. So I, I appreciate that. Uh that you sharing that, but also the, the suggestion that you make. Uh, and I, I'm happy to, to work with you all to reach out to these local universities. I have been engaging the local universities uh, on a number of fronts during the course of the pandemic, uh, both just to gauge how things are going uh, with them uh, because they are some of our largest employers in the District of Columbia. And, and obviously our economy has taken a, a really hard hit because of the pandemic. Um, um, but also to see how they were faring as they seek to recover from the pandemic and reopen and get uh, some of their students on campus as well. And so uh, we have been in communication, my office has, with universities across the District of Columbia, in particular with the Ward 5 uh, universities. I've spoken to uh, each of the presidents of the universities uh, in recent months, and, and I'm happy to, uh, and in fact, I mean, I would be excited to, to, to engage them with you all to think about uh, this sort of partnership and, and see whether that they'd be willing to, to do something like this. Uh, these are the types of things that, that I think you all are immensely helpful with helping me think through and, and, and helping other members of the council think through uh, how we might try to bring additional resources to the fore to, to assist with uh, some of the things that families and, and students, parents are experiencing. So yes, I'd lo love to be able to, be, to do that with you. And, and also, I just want to mention that if, if it's possible, you know, like uh, work with the family, not only with the kids, you know, in the school, if, because as parents, we need to, to how to control, you know, like uh, when they have anxiety or all those kind of feelings. So it's very important that they can work with us together, like as a family, not only with the kids. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. I think your observation spot on because um, you know the, the 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 feelings the emotional uh, uh, stress that people are experiencing isn't simply the students uh, in many cases um, it really is the parents even more than the students I think everybody has their own fair share of, of how they are are, are responding to uh, the pandemic in this new environment of virtual learning and virtual work or being at home with your kid out of a job and having to worry about all the other things associated with the economics of providing 
uh, for your family, uh, are all contributing to uh, just the, the, the trauma and grief and, and, and the weight that people are contending with throughout this pandemic. So absolutely right. Thank you so very much, Zoma, and thank you again, Councilmember McDuffie. And at this time, our final um, parent leader um, who has a question is Charmaine Brandon. She's a Ward 5 parent leader. Um, she's a, a parent of Washington Latin Public Charter School and who is going to be asking about housing supports. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Councilman McDuffie. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, my question is, um, I worked for many years in IT as a contractor. Uh, prior to the pandemic, my contract ended in November of 2019. So I was still searching for work when the pandemic hit in March, 2020, and it made finding work significantly harder. Um, I was blessed to find a new position shortly before the new year um, and I'm underemployed, but my salary still pushes me out of the realm of most assistance programs, even though I have significant debt and like many others will face possible eviction when the moratorium ends. In this pandemic and overall, most assistance programs focus on providing help to those within a certain income bracket. And while those programs are desperately needed, they also leave out a whole segment of the population um, who's been also been severely negatively impacted in COVID and face difficult decisions regarding, regarding affordability of housing, healthcare, and other necessities. What's being done in DC during COVID and long-term to support these families? And how can mortgage and rent assistance eligibility, eligibility be expanded to meet and support the needs of families? Uh, it's a great question, Charmaine, and I appreciate that, that question. It's actually something that, that uh, my staff and I are spending time both on the how to address some of these challenges of middle income residents uh, during the pandemic, but also uh, after the pandemic uh, and what it looks like to be able to, to live in the District of Columbia uh, in an environment uh, specifically pre-pandemic that we saw costs continue to rise. Um, so you are probably aware that we, we have the eviction moratorium in, and although there was a recent court decision um, that that said that you know uh, housing providers can access the courts, did, did that disturb the eviction moratorium that still exists? The federal eviction moratorium also still exists, and so nobody should be uh, uh, you know nobody should be evicting tenants uh, from their homes right now during the pandemic. The challenge that we're facing is. What we found early on in response to some of the questions that we had for the executive, and I think the mayor's even shared that uh, some of the programs that were in place were not being accessed by tenants, uh, particularly the lower income tenants, but some of the uh, the uh, grant programs. And so the mayor then uh, allocated uh, a pot for some of the, the smaller landlords to access to actually defray the cost of the rent. Uh, and we also saw both on the uh, on the the housing front as well as in utilities, people were not registering with the payment plan programs. I don't know if if that's something you've done, but but we want more people to engage with the payment plans because we're I'm concerned that once this pandemic uh, you know it subsides and the public health emergency is lifted, people are going to be looking at these huge um, uh, payments that they're going to be owing uh, to their landlords. So figuring out how to address that so that uh, there won't be these mass uh, efforts to evict tenants uh, throughout the District of Columbia, I think is going to be immensely helpful. Uh, to the extent, frankly, Charmaine, we need more assistance from the federal government. And I'm hopeful that the Biden administration will put money into a funding uh, a package that goes to the states in the District of Columbia, and that this time around, we aren't shortchanged like the District of Columbia was the last time the states got funding. The last time the states got funding, the, the minimum that any state received was 1.25 billion. We only got 755 million and we were out, I'm sorry, we only got 495 million. We were 
out 755 million. And so we haven't given up that effort to get that 755 million. Um, but we also know that we need additional funds to address uh, the challenges that many uh, uh, parents have with not being able to pay their, their rent uh, or their mortgage. Uh, and we wanna be able to step that up. And so locally, we'll continue to look for it. I had a bill that I put in place to try to get money to some of the businesses so that they can hire back and get some of the employees back on the payrolls. Uh, it has been extraordinarily challenging. I've not seen anything like this, as challenging as this since I've been in office. And so uh, we wanna maintain the, the eviction moratorium, but we also want to account for how we get tenants uh, into payment plans so that they aren't waiting. If you, to the extent somebody can pay something, we want them to pay something and, 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 and to do so in a way that's obviously works for their family's budget. Um, but, but we also know that there simply won't be enough resources to go around. And so the, there needs to be a backstop once the public health emergency is lifted to address what inevitably will be, you know, thousands of people who can't pay. So uh, just as a follow-up, I would, you know, ask if there's any consideration for, um, um, cause I know that landlords can apply for assistance, but those are the smaller landlords. Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration for, um, you know, owners of multi-unit buildings um, to be able to apply for assistance? I, I don't think it excludes owners of multi-unit buildings. I guess it depends on how many units you have and how, how large a, a housing provider you are. And I can get the specifics around that. Uh, I know that um, uh, we are looking at that at my committee. We're also looking at ways that if you're an owner of a multi-unit building, uh, if you, for some reason, may not be able to access a grant directly, there may be some tax benefit that you could um, accrue to help defray some of the costs associated with um, you know, the fact that you're not getting rent from your tenants. And so we're, we're trying to look at all the angles uh, okay. to see how we might be able to support uh, both tenants and smaller landlords uh, who, I mean, we've had people reach out to us who, who are owner-occupied four-unit buildings, for example, who, you know, are struggling to pay their mortgage on their building because their tenants can't pay, right? And so we, we're seeing everything uh, is being thrown at us right now in terms of uh, the challenges that people are facing during this pandemic. And if you have specific suggestions that we can talk about offline, Charmaine, then I'm, I'm happy to, to, to uh, engage with you to see how we can address it uh, in terms of the income issues that you mentioned as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You bet. Thank you so much, Charmaine. Thank you again, Councilmember McDuffie, for your time today with us. And um, I was thinking about the listening lab question that, as a follow-up that I had earlier. Um, I dream public charter school um, where my where our kids go um, did some uh, listening labs for they do it every other Wednesday uh, for not just the parents but the community as well to kind of put their input into what's going on in the opening of schools. So I just want to just let you know about that when you asked me about that and I just couldn't think of it offhand. Um, but at this time. Um, I'm going to turn it over back to uh, Maya at this time. Um, but Councilmember McDuffie, when you get a chance, if you and your staff will go through our statement of belief, it's been enhanced. Uh, we thank you for this healthy discussion, and we look further for uh, to more healthier discussions in the future. And thank you, uh, Ray, for facilitating. I appreciate it. Uh, no problem. Thanks so much, uh, Ray. Um, and Councilmember McDuffie, we have a bunch of questions that are in the chat. So I'm gonna start with a couple of Ward 5 questions that are specific, because we have a few Langley Elementary current and former parents. Um, and so their question from Christina Robbins, um, Ward 5 Langley Elementary School parent, and Kat Zambon, um, a Ward 5 parent who now has children, who used to have children at Langley, and now they're at Stevens. Um, is asking a question about um, the disparity of infrastructure. So Langley is in great need of modernization. Um, according to Christina, we need a new roof. Our bathrooms are not functioning or in tolerable shape. Some of our rooms don't have working intercoms. Many of us have sent emails asking for the modernization. Um, can you help them to figure out how to advocate for that? They have no date set for remodeling to occur. Um, and Kat followed that up um, on Christina saying, how can we possibly think of ch sending children back to school in a pandemic when not all the bathrooms in the school are working? So I think this is a Langley specific question, but from a few, we have a few Langley elementary parents um, that are on the phone. And so I think they'd love to have some clarity on that. 
So on, on the timing of, of renovations, we, we're happy to, to try to help you all get that information to see where it falls in the queue uh, for mm -hmm. modernizations. I think one of the challenges is that, you know, all the modernizations that have taken place over the years have not been equal. Uh, you know, some of them have, have, have been simply substandard to others that have happened more recently. So if you've got a phase one, you know, five, six, seven years ago, um, uh, you know, some of the ones that I've seen just simply did not look as good uh, or did not address some of the bigger challenges as some of the more recent modernizations that have taken place. And I've raised that issue uh, previously with uh, former council member uh, Grasso and Chairman Mendelson, and, and I'll continue to raise that issue because uh, about shortly before I started in, in around the time that I started in 12, we had some phase ones take place in, in Ward 5, I think it like uh, Bunker Hill, Langdon, and some other places. And, you know, they were, you know, they had a, a decent amount of funding in them, but the, 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 the modernizations, when I compared them, when I started just visiting other schools across the District of Columbia to see what theirs looked like, um, I saw some disparities. In some cases, it was, you know, and, and hope parents don't take this the wrong way. It seemed to me that where you had parents with greater resources, they were bringing in almost, it's felt like consultants to help them think through what they even should be asking for. And so to the extent things are being received where other parents in other parts of the city, it's not even on their mind to even ask for it. I feel like that's another disparity that exists in some cases. In terms of Langley's bathrooms, um, um, you know, look, bathrooms should work, period. I mean, there's no excuses for that. And I don't, I don't understand why the bathrooms wouldn't be working. Uh, that wasn't something that anybody had raised when I, I'd done the tour. In fact, I visited in several of the bathrooms um, when, when my staff and I visited uh, some months ago. And so we're happy to, to see what the status of that is. I mean, DCPS is, is, is paying for these modernization, uh, the, the renovations to the filter systems and to the extent they don't have HVAC systems that allow for it, they have the units in each of the classrooms. And so I'm happy to, to, to follow up to see why any of the bathrooms would not be working and, and what the expectation is for parents uh, who are considering sending their kids back if they can't even get the bathrooms to work in, in, inside of these buildings. I mean, that, that's simply unacceptable. I'm not sure why that is. Thanks, Councilmember McDuffie. And um, there are a few questions from Ward 7 parents. Um, Jamie Hall, who has children at Rocket Ship, and Cesar Chavez, Sharon Culver, who has a child at Beers, um, and uh, uh, Elizabeth Reddick, who has a child at Bridges, about reopening. And so the question is, like, how there are a couple different components of that. One is, how are how is the city and city leaders thinking about supporting families who don't feel safe sending children back? Um, Sharon, that's Jamie's question. Sharon's question is around um, for the safety of teachers, if, knowing that like school is in-person school could provide a greater opportunity for kids to be successful in their learning, but how are we making it safe for teachers um, to make sure that kids um, are able to uh, have what they need during this time. And then uh, Elizabeth's question is about how do, can we make sure that there's partnership between schools um, that are seeing success in schools that need extra support um, across wards. So not just inside a ward five, but, but, but learning between wards. Um, and so those are a few questions about reopening that I think um, uh, parents have questions about. We'll, we'll do, make that our last question before we um, close out. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I understand the first question. Yep. If you could just repeat that first question one time. So the first question is around for parents who don't feel comfortable sending their children back to school. Um, mm -hmm. How are we making sure that those parents uh, are able to feel safe, right? Um, because they have concerns yeah. about health or concerns about mental health, right? Um, Jamie gave an example for a child having separation anxiety, which has grown worse in the pandemic. Um, and so the questions about how are we making sure that parents feel safe in that return? Then Sharon's questions about how do we make sure teachers feel safe? safe um, and that return as well and are able to do um, their hard jobs. Um, and then the last piece is um, around Elizabeth saying, how can we make sure that schools are sharing um, how they're doing this work across wards? Yeah, I think that that first question is, is probably one of the tougher questions to answer. How, how do we make sure that parents are feel, feel safe sending their kids back to school? I think the, the way we, 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 we try to do that and I say try because we have to make sure that we're communicating with the parents and we understand 
what the concerns are before we can help them feel safe and sending their kids back to school. As a parent, um, I know my, there are lots of things that my wife and I consider about, about school safety, right? And we ask tons of questions and we make sure that the answers are coming from the people who are best situated to answer those questions. Um, but the lines of communications have to be open because every parent is not gonna feel as empowered as my wife and I do to, to, to get the answers or even to ask the questions. And so I think it's important for DCPS to make sure in DCPCS that they're reaching out to the parents in a way that is designed to maximize the feedback and understand the concerns that parents have. So that, and I think it's the same for teachers, right? You, you know, we've all read about and heard about some of the challenges that, that, um, that uh, this is a particular challenge of, of DCPS with, with, with ensuring and, and providing an environment where the teachers feel confident in coming back and, and a lot of the back and forth. You know, if I am a parent and the teachers that teach my kids don't wanna be in school and don't feel safe, I'm not sending my, my kid back to the school, right? And so I think this is not something that can happen in silos. The, 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 the communication has to be transparent across the board without exception. This is a global pandemic and this is not a theoretical exercise. Literally people are dying, right? And so, and so until people feel confident that they actually are getting the information and, and this is a two-way uh, uh, street and the feedback is transparent, then, then, it, then parents are not gonna have confidence and teachers are not gonna have confidence and the system is not gonna work. And guess what? The disparities that already exist and the ones that existed before the pandemic in terms of educational outcomes are gonna be exacerbated during this pandemic as some of the early information we're getting exhibits, right? And so, so we've got to cut through as much as possible the politics and put the resources into, uh, into making sure all these safety checklists can be checked and that the teachers who are in these schools understand what uh, measures have been taken the vaccines, the vaccines are getting to these teachers that we're looking at the, the, the schools and the communities that you know have you know the, the larger challenges that we all know exist um, are we're meeting these people where they are and we're meeting these parents where they are and not expecting that everybody's gonna be knocking down our door to ask questions. Uh, and so you know it's sort of a long way of saying that, you know, the, the, the schools, both DCPS and DCPS, have to continue to engage in a way that is fully transparent. That's the only way you're going to inspire uh, confidence, by allowing people to ask questions, getting them the information about what you're doing to ensure safety uh, in, in these schools, period. Uh, I think, I think the, the final part was, how do we make sure it's happening across the board? Um, again, the deputy mayor, uh, and the leaders of these schools, including the council members, have to be asking questions and visiting to see what's happening at Langley versus what's happening at Brown versus what's happening at Phelps or McKinley or KIPP um, um, to be also share some of the best practices. The thing about this pandemic is that it is unprecedented. And so why I do get upset about how the vaccine is being distributed and sometimes I, I get loud, I also understand that, that and I do believe that people like Dr. LaCrange Nesbitt and others are doing the best that they possibly can. I believe that the mayor is doing the best that she possibly can. Doesn't mean that, that we're always gonna get it right, but we have to be communicating, look at what other jurisdictions are doing. And if something is working somewhere else, see if it's a fit for DC. Everything that's happening in New York or California or Texas isn't gonna be the best fit for our school system. We have our own unique challenges, but it does mean that we all options should be on the table, period. And this is a all hands on deck uh, response required in terms of educating our kids. 
Thanks so much, Councilmember McDuffie. And there are a few extra questions that we'll make sure to send to you and your team. Thank you, Jonathan, for also being here with us today um, from Councilmember McDuffie's staff. Um, and there are some questions as well about how to access some of the programs that you talked about, Councilmember McDuffie, like the rent um, program. So we'll make sure to send those your way so that um, constituents can get those answered. Um, but right now, I'm going to turn it over to Morgan because there's not a PAVE event if we don't take a PAVE photo. Um, so this year, unfortunately, we don't have a scarf for you right now, Councilmember McDuffie, but we'll make sure to send one your way. Um, it's going to be purple this year, so a little different from the usual yellow, um, so that you can continue rocking your PAVE gear everywhere that you go uh, and be a part of that purple wave. But we want to say thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to Morgan so we can take our pictures. And if everyone can make sure that you put yourself on camera just for this quick second, um, and super shout out to everyone who's joining while at work, um, just like Anna did today. Um, and thank you, Anna, for being an essential worker. So also a shout out to all of our essential workers um, and sending you lots of light. Um, so I'll just turn it over to Morgan. And thank you, Maya. And thank you all once again to PAVE. I appreciate you all sincerely.